Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anita Roach, Program Manager for the ICA. I have the pleasure of not only moderating our next session, When Standard Treatments Fail, but also introducing two of my favorite and outside of the box thinking physicians in the IC community. A member of both the ICA Medical, or, sorry, Board of Directors and Medical Advisory Board, Dr. Robert Maldwin is a physician in charge of urologic infectious and inflammatory diseases at the Smith Institute of Urology and director of the Interstitial Society Center at North Shore LIJ Health System. Dr. Christine Whitmore is a member of the ICA Medical Advisory Board and the founder and director of the Pelvic and Sexual Health Institute of Philadelphia. She is also chair of urology and female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery at Drexel University College of Medicine. Both doctors Maldwin and Whitmore are on the forefront of research and therapy for people with IC. They consistently go above and beyond their patients for their patients and are considered among the leading experts in the world. Thank you so much for being here and joining us today, Dr. Maldwin and Whitmore. Hello. Whoa. <laughs> That's a deep chair. So this session is going to be mostly Q&A. We have questions from pre-registrants, and I'll get started with the first question. Is the lifespan of the bladder shortened with IC? I'll let Christine take the hard questions. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Is the lifespan? Yes. Start with IC? Um, is it shortened with IC? Oh, it's shortened, I'm sorry. Uh, I know there's no academic literature on that. Um, there is a small incidence, unfortunately, of people who have suicidal ideation. Um, certainly, chronic illness can increase stress levels, especially through anxiety. I don't know, I think there probably are some studies that show shortened lifespan through that. But I think that's looking at it with a glass half empty. I prefer to answer that question by saying, with the glass half full, let's get you into remission so you don't even have to ask that question. Um, the, the only thing I can think of, and just in terms of lifespans, uh, there's a, as many of you know, there's a specific form of interstitial cystitis which is associated with gross inflammation. These are these patients with these Hunter's lesions. And unfortunately, what we see in many of this particular relatively small uh, patient group is that the bladder has a lot of fibrosis, a lot of scar tissue within it. And continued inflammation uh, can make it get smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's the only specific situation I can think of a, of a lifespan of the bladder. Um, you know, it's our job to try to keep it going. Uh, to keep the bladder capacity up, to keep the inflammation at bay. And when we talk about these therapies where, um, you know, what do you do beyond the, the, the typical scope of urological practice? This is what uh, Christine and I are very unfortunately frequently involved with. Isn't it interesting, Rob, that you went to the bladder and I went to the body? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do when someone fails uh, pen uh, antihistamines, antidepressants, physical therapy, and the other treatments on the AUA guidelines. What's next? Well, first of all, the AUA guidelines, which were published in uh, 211, uh, both Rob and I were consultants, um, actually have five different uh, levels of treatment. And the first line of treatment would be behavioral, education, changing your lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. The second line would be physical therapy and some of our uh, well-known medications such as Elmeron, um, hydroxyzine, amitriptyline, and then you move into bladder installations, uh, hydrodistension, and treatment of a hunter's lesion. Uh, then you can move on to things such as cyclosporine, 
which is a, an immune modulation type of drug, which if you're going to take should be uh, regulated by an internist or rheumatologist. And then we can go on to neurostimulation, Botox, and last and very rare, uh, removal of the bladder and or diverting the urine. So when a patient fails the first two or three of those, uh, we have to go into more focused uh, therapies uh, after identifying the pain generator. This particular patient probably has more than just a bladder problem. So for the bladder, uh, doesn't bladder installations weren't mentioned. For high tone pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, uh, oral or suppository muscle relaxants, vigorous physical pelvic floor physical therapy, and then we would go on to trigger points and maybe even Botox into the high tone pelvic floor muscles, the trigger points themselves. And if it's uh, and or vulva related, we can use a series of compounded uh, compounds. You know, I just wanted to echo Christine's remarks because I think one of the biggest problems and failures uh, for therapy regarding interstitial cystitis is the the lack of just finding these other, as we call them, pain generators. Uh, the vulvodynia, the pelvic floor dysfunction, all these can contribute uh, a huge percentage of the, the, the pain, discomfort, and interestingly, many of the urinary type complaints that patients present with. So it's important to, for your clinicians out there to, and for you to know yourselves that these things exist. Uh, they need to be identified and specific treatments need to be uh, made uh, directed towards those problems to get the best um, to get the best re symptom relief, and to keep in mind that unfortunately these things can occur together. It's not like there's I, this patient has interstitial cystitis, this patient has pelvic floor dysfunction. We this is part and parcel of our practice. Patients come in with vulvar pain syndromes, high tone pelvic floor dysfunction, the interstitial cystitis. So the way we look at it, and I know Christine looks at it the same way, it's sort of like peeling an onion. We say this to all, almost every patient that walks through the door. We have to go step by step to try to figure what exactly is going on to get that directed therapy going. So it seems like for some patients, you have to look beyond the bladder sometimes? Yeah. Okay. The whole body. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there are some well-known, what we call comorbidities or coexisting illnesses, which I'm sure a lot of you, fortunately or unfortunately, know a little bit about, uh, fibromyalgia, endometriosis, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, you can also go into other uh, autoimmune diseases such as Sjogren's syndrome. So there are other uh, areas besides the bladder that are causing problems. Also, uh, there's different phenotypes, meaning different kinds of uh, bladder pain syndrome or interstitial cystitis. You have someone who has only the bladder as a pain generator. You have this other person who has all of these coexisting illnesses. They're probably not exactly the same condition. And where we're going now in terms of pain treatments, after we agree on the appropriate definitions with these phenotypes, is that there'll be different treatments allotted to each of the different phenotypes. When we get there, I think we'll understand the condition a lot better. Thank you very much to the MAP people who are studying this. Also, the MAP people came up with statistics today that are identical to what we've all been saying for the last 20 years. Thank heavens. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't know exactly the different subtypes just yet, but we do know that men get IC and women get IC. Is there are there treatments that are better for men with IC versus women with IC? Well, I think uh, one of the things the MAP uh, results showed us today is that 50% uh, of men actually have bladder pain syndrome, and it's not about the prostate so much. So I think one of the things that's been difficult when comparing the male and uh, female phenotype of interstitial cystitis is that we didn't know how much the prostate was contributing to the male side. But in general, if the patient has a tender bladder or if the pain goes away when you put uh, an anesthetic agent such as lidocaine into the bladder, that identifies the bladder as a pain generator. That patient would have an identical treatment as a woman that has the bladder identified as a pain generator. 
I think that um, I'm so glad you asked the question because I got to tell you, if you, if I was listening to to all the speakers, and there is, a, it's a clear cut. This, I won't. We're not saying discrimination, but there's there's such a bias uh, in this whole field towards women, obviously, because of, and it's justly so because we do know that most of the, the IC patients are females. But um, there are tons of guys out there with interstitial cystitis. And actually, Quentin, who presented this morning, did publish uh, some work, uh, I think within the past year or two, just documenting how many guys out there act actually have interstitial cystitis. It's an amazingly high number, one or two million. I, I forgot exactly where it, where it, where it uh, uh, worked out to, but it, it's, it's very high. Uh, many of the guys who have been previously diagnosed with conditions such as prostatitis, what we now call the uh, chronic prostatitis, male chronic pelvic pain syndrome, traditionally treated with anti-inflammatories and, I mean, all the different medicines we used for prostate enlargement and are failing and failing and failing, we now just flip them over to a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis where a, a much wider array of treatments are available, and these guys are starting to get better, which is a wonderful thing. I think the biggest problem that at least we have just from a practical perspective with a guy, it's hard enough to convince a female patient to accept a bladder installation. That's or correct. Say, guys, <laughs> listen, I'm a guy too. I don't want it. Okay, so um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit more of a challenge, but it is surprising uh, yeah. how, how well many of these guys do, uh, do at, at the end of the line uh, when we're very happy. So we're out there. We're thinking about you. Um, and um, hopefully we'll make some strides for, for, for the male population as well. Okay. I know we posted recently on the Facebook page that we want to hear more sure. from men with IC, so we're working on building more resources for that group. Another question we have is, are the treatments in the AUA guidelines applicable for children with IC? Can you use the same treatments? Well, um, I don't think we can officially state that anybody under the age of 18 uh, would be amenable to these therapies because all of the studies from which the evidence was taken for the guidelines, uh, you have to be 18 years or older to be in an NIH trial. So uh, can we use that as a guide? Of course we can. Can we use that as a mandated statement? No. The only, the only comment I have with children is that we have to be really careful when diagnosing interstitial cystitis in kids. Kids notoriously have, um, it is, uh, have problems with voiding dysfunctions, uh, which pediatric urologists see pretty much on, a, on an everyday basis. Um, there's a very well-known condition. It's now been termed BBD, bladder bowel dysfunction, where kids have chronic constipation, irritative voiding symptoms. Often it, it's, it can be accompanied by some pain straining maneuvers and so forth. And those types of, of conditions, which are very, very common, can be treated with very simple uh, remedies, such as behavioral modification, biofeedback techniques, and so forth. So we w don't want to let this, the swing of the pendulum go so far as to call every kid who has irritations with voiding, uh, having interstitial cystitis and getting them on starting to put medicines in their bladder and starting them on conventional therapy when very simple uh, therapy guided through pediatric urology would be uh, quite helpful. Great. Thank you for your responses. We had a lot of people talking about low-dose low dose naltrexone and how that works for IC. Is it effective? Do we know anything about that? Well, I think the literature would only, uh, there no literature on any kind of a controlled trial in the util for its utilization in interstitial cystitis. However, uh, it has been used in low doses for fibromyalgia, and there was a 12-week study uh, where it was utilized for patients with Crohn's disease, and Crohn's disease is uh, basically chronic diarrhea with abdominal pain, and uh, has, uh, on biopsy is shown to have a lot of inflammation. Just like if you biopsy a Hunter's lesion in the bladder, you'll see inflammation. Anyway, for the Crohn's patients that took naltrexone at a low dose, they had a 60% response rate in both decreased inflammation on biopsies and also uh, on their quality of life questionnaires as opposed to the 30% for placebo. 
So they had twice the effect. In the fibromyalgia gr group, it was about 30% more effect on questionnaires than it was for placebo. So it might be interesting to study. By the way, it's an opioid antagonist. So if somebody's having problems taking the opioids, um, maybe we can start to think this way. It also uh, is anti-inflammatory so that uh, just like the biopsy specimens didn't show inflammation in the Crohn's disease patients, perhaps some of our inflammatory biomarkers, such as C-reactive protein that was mentioned in the MAP study, might be a good uh, uh, secondary endpoint in the study. Is that something, a medication that a patient could ask their doctor to try out? I don't think we know enough about it because it's not studied. Uh, if a pain management person or even an experienced uh, IC provider uh, wanted to, they could probably prescribe it as an off-label medication with the patient's understanding that we don't know uh, what the effects on the liver are. Uh, it was first used to treat alcoholism. There was liver side effects, can cause dizziness, other things. But if someone is willing to try it, and the provider is willing to give it, and the patient is watched very closely, you could probably utilize it. But I really think we need to see it studied. So you mentioned the use of off-label drugs for IC. A lot of times, IC patients use OAB drugs to control their IC. Do you usually recommend that or recommend that in certain cases? You know, when a patient, most patients who come to our practice have, have used medications for overactive bladder, your classic, the ditropans, the detrols, the sanctuaries, there are about seven or eight of them out there, uh, and they fail. That's why they're in our, our offices. Um, that said, there are probably about 16, 17% of patients who have interstitial cystitis who have some component of OAB, and they probably would uh, do fairly well with those medications. In fact, if you take a look at a medication like amitriptyline, one of our earlier, uh, you know, staged agents, uh, that has lots of anticholinergic properties. The biggest problem I think that we see with these types of agents is that they make IC patients in the in general pretty. They feel they sometimes feel worse uh, because many of you, I'm sure, you've experienced yourself. You, the urine coming out is not really. It's not gushing, that's for sure. Uh, it takes a while to get it started up and so forth, and that may be because of that, a bit of uh, pelvic floor problems that you might have along with the bladder problem. Now you take a medication to relax your bladder, and what happens? You either, it, you shut down even more, you can't, and you have to push more to get it out, and that in turn makes your problem even worse. So many of us have had bad experiences with these types of agents. Again. However, there is that subset of patients that tends to do okay with it. There's a new uh, medication uh, called Mirabegron, uh, Mirabetric, which is the, the brand name of it, which is a completely new class of medications for OAB, uh, overactive bladder. Uh, again, it's, uh, it relaxes the bladder uh, for patients who have to get to the bathroom really quickly. Um, we're now, a lot of groups, including I'm sure Christine's, I know you are using it, uh, and we're using it as well. Yeah. And it seems that the patients seem to be doing a bit better, has a much better side effect profile. Uh, we do have to watch them for hypertension that can uh, develop uh, while taking it, though. Well, I think one of the biggest benefits is it works differently than all of the other overactive bladder medicines. And the standard overactive bladder medicine has a tendency to cause constipation. A lot of people with really tight muscles already have constipation. As we learned earlier, uh, from the soon-to-be Dr. Stein, uh, is that uh, that's a really bad thing. Mirbetric does not cause constipation. So in that phenotype subtype of patient that really uh, has urgency that's not uh, responsive to an analgesic such as pyridium, which turns your urine orange, or something like Urabel, which turns it blue-green, and they still have a very strong urge, it might be worth a try. Great. We had a woman write in to ask, can symptoms get better with hormone use? 
or do oh, they get worse? That's your belly. <laughs> you, you, you go. <laughs> uh, well, unfortunately, there's not a lot of literature that's good um, on hormone utilization in uh, any of the bladder conditions. Uh, estrogen, in fact, was found to make incontinence uh, worse. But uh, having said that, there are a number of patients as they go through menopause, that's either when they get their symptoms or when their symptoms get worse. So uh, the first thing you need to do is find out where they are in life. Are they menopausal? Have they recently gone on a very low-dose low birth control pill, which is associated with uh, vulvodynia? Um, so where are they in the lifespan? Uh, then you want to know uh, where the pain generators are. Is it a bladder problem and or vulvar problem and or muscle problem uh, and or just what we call atrophic vaginitis where the tissues get very dry in the vagina and pale and there's decreased secretions and sex, for example, is very painful. So. Uh, hormone utilization in this group would be best served by checking hormone levels and then starting some estrogen cream. If there's sexual dysfunction with it, you might want to get baseline hormone levels and add a testosterone cream. In terms of taking oral drugs, patches, and other agents, I think uh, we would want to be sure that there's no history of cancer in the family and also warn the patient that they may be at, at increased risk. But there's also a number of compounding pharmacists who will make quote unquote bioidentical hormones. Uh, if you're going, if your doctor would like to prescribe them or your provider would like to prescribe them for you, you need to have baseline hormone levels and hormone levels about every three months or so to do it safely. That is a decision that is made between you as the patient and your uh, provider. You know, I just have one comment, uh, and then I was gonna ask Christine a question. Um, you know, a, a lot of what we see, so many instances, uh, well, actually, the comment I was going to make is when I see a patient who's having horrible flares throughout their menstrual period, um, the first thing, that, at least one of the things that pops into my mind is endometriosis. But that's not usually what we see with most IC patients. In fact, most IC patients tend to have a reduction of symptoms while they're having their menstrual flow, but they still have a really bad premenstrual flare. And in some instances, it is a horror, I mean, as many of you know, it's a horror story. So the question I have for you. Are you recommending um, like long-term birth control? I mean, what's your strategy with those patients? Well, um, continuous, uh, birth, the continuous birth control means that you take it for 90 days and then you bleed for a week. Uh, the most popular uh, one right now is Seasonique. Um, that would be an initial treatment for endometriosis anyway, mm -hmm. so it doesn't hurt to try it. One of the things you do have to warn the patient about, however, is breakthrough bleeding. There's more than one brand available, so you can certainly try uh, more than one. But most patients uh, don't tolerate it fairly well. And for that, it's but only for that phenotype, that subset of patients who gets really bad premenstrual flares. So it sounds like with treatment, it really is about finding what subset you're in and what works best for you. And along the same lines, a lot of people are asking about Botox. Do you use Botox in your practices? We're, 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 both, yeah. we're both Botox advocates. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, you, Botox, Botox is a big, big field, very hot field. I'm sure many of you know. I think it's in the ICA update. Um, there's a lot of uh, talk about it. Um, it can be used as a very effective agent to relax the pelvic floor. So I think, in fact, I would wager we probably, that's where you, most of the Botox is used in your practice as well as mine. Um, if we can identify trigger points, uh, patients are doing well just injecting a little anesthetic in there. Uh, the hope is that we can get a longer uh, response. It's a different type of response. It's not necessarily just an anesthetic response we're getting out of Botox. It's most importantly to relax the muscles. They're not in spasm. You relieve that high tone pelvic floor dysfunction and symptoms. Um, the other use of Botox um, is, uh, is in the bladder itself. Uh, this is where I have a, a bit more problem with it. Um, there is this risk and if you know about this, that it relaxes your bladder so well uh, that you can go into urinary retention. 
Uh, there are two actually very good, relatively recent studies out right now that show that the risk of retention is pretty low. It's not bad. Six, it's six, about 6%. And the most recent study has shown that over a, a month or two, et cetera, um, the, that effect where you might need a catheter uh, would go away. But at the, the flip side is that many patients are doing relatively well with these types of therapies. In this instance, the bo when you inject the Botox into the bladder, we're not trying to treat overactive bladder here. We're trying to treat the sensory disorder, which is part and parcel of interstitial cystitis. And I think most of us, at least, are doing a lot of injections along the base of the bladder, where we normally don't inject when we're, when we're trying to, um, to work with an overactive bladder patient. So it, it's a risk, and that's why it is not first-line therapy. Okay, it's up there. Uh, and of course, the other downside, apart from the retention issue, uh, is, is um, that it doesn't last. Uh, but the good news is that we find that if you give subsequent injections, which may have to be given every somewhere, I hate to say it, every three to six months, something like that, it seems that the, the next effect seems to be just as good as the first. We had initial concerns that we'd, people would develop tolerance, and now there are studies at least up to a year or, or a bit more which show continued efficacy. I, I mirror everything that's been said, and I unfortunately did put one patient into retention by putting it in the bladder, and my life wasn't as miserable as hers, but I really fell for her because she's a pain patient that had to catheterize several times a day. So people have recommended, as Dr. Mullen has just said, is to put it closer to the neck of the bladder where most of the sensory nerve ends, the endings are anyway, and the literature uh, suggests that there's no real retention when it's injected there. But the pelvic floor muscles, uh, if you're going to do that, and these are patients who've uh, they've had oral or suppository ballet or uh, muscle relaxant. They've had pelvic floor physical therapy with internal massage or theo massage. They've had trigger point injections. Um, and these have all failed. Those are the patients that would get Botox injected directly about up to 60 units into each trigger point. What's a trigger point? Well, a trigger point. Most of us, if we don't know, if we don't understand the floor, the muscles of the pelvic floor, we all know ever since we've been a teenager that we get stiff necks. If you push on it and it's tender, taut line, it's tender. A lot of times you can push on it and it will actually twitch. Or you push on it here and the pain that you feel over here, the referred area, uh, is also the pain is duplicated. So you don't go to Botox until you've failed all of these other things and until we've identified the specific trigger point. But it can be very effective. And then it takes two days to two weeks to work. So we usually start physical therapy back up again uh, after Botox so that we can get the most out of our therapy. And that last point that Christine made, I just want to echo that. Um, it's so important. This is really integrative medicine. It's, 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 you can't just get a shot and everything's going to be honky-dory. It's, it's a commitment. You're still working with physical therapy, perhaps muscle relaxants. You're still applying heat or what have you. You're, still, um, you're, you're not just l letting a pill or a shot take care of the remedy, the, the entire problem. That's correct. What other types of trigger point injections are there besides Botox, lidocaine? Well, there's dry needling, uh, which is when you just stick a needle into the, this will be for a trigger point that was twitching, and it'll take that twitch out of it. Uh, you can use anesthetic agents and or uh, steroids. We happen to use a homeopathic agent called Tramiel because it's non-steroidal, but it is anti-inflammatory. So you want an analgesic, and you want something that will cut down on the inflammation. You know, many of you may ask, well, this, this doctor gives me this shot in my pelvic floor, and it's, it's lidocaine. Do you know how long lidocaine lasts in your, in your body? Well, first of all, it's metabolized incredibly quickly, but it, it may have an effect of about an hour, maybe two hours, something like that. Uh, and often we'll mix it with other agents that have a longer lasting effect, but the best you're going to do is about five or six hours of pain relief. And the question is, why would that be at all helpful? And we really don't, I mean, there are lots of different theories about it. Um, I sort of, the way I explain it to patients, sort of like rebooting a computer, because many of these patients, get, they get incredible uh, durations of effect 
it can be days, it can be weeks. Um, it's, it's, it's quite impressive. So um, it's something to consider. But it's all often mixed with longer acting agents as well. Great. We had a question come in about kidney stones and other kidney diseases. Is that associated with IC? Well, I don't, I think there was one poster recently that showed an, that reported an increased incidence when you compared it to the uh, prevalence or incidence of the general population was higher in the IC patients. But that uh, study came out of the South where it's hot. Um, I think what happens sometimes, and this is not evidence-based, this is my opinion, uh, is that a lot of IC patients don't drink as much as they think they do. So uh, if you don't drink and you're prone to forming stones, then you have a higher likelihood of having a stones. Uh, very interesting. One of the early treatments that we've used is potassium citrate, and that makes the urine less acid. And that's one of the agents that's used to treat kidney stones. So I must say, now that I'm not using that agent as much, I'm seeing more patient, I see patients who have kidney stones. But that's not scientific and it should be studied. I, just to, uh, I would just have to restate what you said. <laughs> I mean, I know, I think there's one other study. Is it, is it, the, the one I'm thinking is from Taiwan. And I, that one too, yeah. So I, I wasn't even sure whether there could be a, a food issues. Um, and I think your point goes along with basically with a lot of things that the whole diet issue with, with uh, Dr. Shorter. Um, it's not only what you eat, it's also how much you eat, and there's so many factors involved. Uh, one of the biggest problems that we've had with new IC patients is the fact that they underdrink. Uh, we look at the concentrations of their urine walking through the door, and usually, you know, if they're not carrying the pole and spring or whatever, um, that's a bad sign. Yes. <laughs> that's a bad sign. Uh, so when your urine looks like, like uh, yellow paint, not a good thing, okay? It should be light. You, for, for whatever reason, your urine is, is, is yellow, but it's a good marker. Um, it should be light straw colored to practically clear, and then you're, 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 you're probably in pretty good shape. But you don't have to gulp the water down. Right. You can carry a water bottle with you and drink one slow sip every five to ten minutes. And you can tell how much you drank during the day because it's how many times you filled the bottle. And that way, your kidneys are making a constant amount of urine so you don't gulp it down. The kidneys make a whole bunch of urine. They fill up the bladder real fast. And I got to go. <laughs> uh, instead, it's, it's a regular, it's regulated over a period of time. And I think that's how I've gotten more liquid is into a lot of patients. Do either of you have um, any experience with hyperbaric oxygen for IC? There's I know, a yeah. little bit. There's yeah. a little bit in the literature. But it's, uh, it's fairly, uh, there's a paucity or, or a rarity of it. Uh, it's the way it works is it increases the blood flow, which is why they use it on uh, diabetic ulcers and, and conditions that have lack of blood flow. Uh, one would think that a chronically inflamed organ would have a decreased blood flow. Um, we don't really have a lot of good studies on that. Uh, insurance companies, I'm not sure if they would, would it takes 30 treatments, that's the problem, daily treatments. And if your insurance is going to cover it, fine. It's not, uh, there's no code for its utilization in interstitial cystitis. Theoretically, uh, it might be a wonderful non-invasive therapy. I, I've never used it. Um, I, I mean, the, where I would, the, the, the specific instance that I could possibly see its usefulness would be in a, in a Hunter's ulcer patient where bleeding was an issue. But to be honest with you, I think we have better treatments, whether it be burning these lesions, putting installations in the yeah. bladder. The, um, and even if those, if those therapies are failing, the likelihood of, of, uh, of hyperbarics getting, uh, fixing the problem, I think, is, is quite low. And if you take a look at the literature that's available, it's only a modest improvement. It's, it's, there's nothing that's stunning that, that, that I've seen as far as that uh, form of care is concerned. So speaking of Hunter's lesions, we had a question about the difference between fulguration and lasering. One's electrical energy and one's light energy. Is either one more effective? No, and the other thing you can do with them is inject it with a kenalog, which is a steroid, which is what we do. 
We, uh, we've been doing the same thing. We, we've sort of gone through this weird progression, but it's not really weird. It's, it's, a, it's a progression that is sort of dedicated towards helping patients, but trying to mitigate problems associated with these procedures. So we started, when we started and we published on uh, the use of YAG laser therapy for interstitial cystitis for these specific lesions. And patients did quite well, but in knowing, but most of these lesions, unfortunately, are sort of on the top of the bladder, and on the other side of the top of the bladder is your bowel. And we had one patient come to our center from another facility where the, the laser went right through the bladder, and, and you can't tell whether you're what's called perforating the bladder or not. And unfortunately, in this patient, it did, and she was now left with seven feet less of, of her small, small bowel. So that information in hand, somebody else's unfortunate experience, we've changed to the, we've changed to the electrofulguration, which is essentially what your doctors might even do in the, in the office. It's a, it's what we call a Bugby electrode. We burn it, and it's a deep burn. The problem with Hunter's, Hunter's lesions themselves is the natural process of having inflammation in your bladder causes bladder scarring. It just, that's why I'm saying, you ask what the length of, you know, how long a bladder is going to last. Those patients were really concerned about it because the one thing that gets them to ultimately, unfortunately, to having their bladder removed or the urine diverted to, to some external device or internal device or what have you um, is the fact that there's no capacity left. They, they, patients are going to the bathroom so much, not necessarily at this point because of pain, but because their bladder is a thimble. So my impression was that every time we were burning, we might, and there's no literature to substantiate this, but I felt like every time we're burning, we might be causing even more scar tissue or hastening that process. So it's almost like I think we sort of started around the same time we started injecting them with a steroid. And so far, I mean, we don't have that all our data collected on it, but patients are doing awesome. I mean, they're, they, the concept here is let's just try to locally decrease the inflammatory events um, by injecting with a steroid. It might even, it's, it's called triamcinolone. It's the same steroid that's used for, you ever see these big ugly keloid scars that some people develop after any kind of surgery? It's plastic surgeons inject them to try to decrease the inflammation and the scarring that's uh, in, in those regions. We can do this in the bladder. So we're doing it, and again, Knockwood people are doing uh, very well. I think com comparable in terms of the length between the needed treatments to, to, the, to the burning. Um, the only problem we've had, I don't know if you've seen it, we have to do this in the OR because when we start injecting them, the only problem is we have to do a little bit of burning because the injection sites tend to bleed a lot. That's, that's the only downside that we've had. But we've had no patients have to yeah, come I mean, back. The, yeah, these, the, the people that, when you have a hunter's lesion, uh, in the bladder, the lining of the bladder is very, very damaged, so, and it bleeds very easily. So occasionally we have to fulgurate it. But one other thing that if you are premenopausal, in other words, you're still getting your period, you, there is a chance that you can absorb the steroid, and I tell the patients to expect irregular menstrual periods for about three months. How do patients know if they have Hunter's lesion? Ooh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, we did a study on this because one would, might assume if you have a lot of inflammation in your bladder, um, you might assume you have a lot of pus in your bladder that you can see on a urinalysis, or you have or you have blood. You can see it, this what's called microscopic or visual uh, blood in the urine. Um, that's only true 50% of the time. So the only real way of knowing is to really is to look in the bladder. Now, the big question is, is that part of the IC guidelines now? And it, it isn't. Uh, you don't have to look in the bladder. But obviously, if a patient is not responding to therapies, then I think it's, of course, it's incumbent upon the practitioner to start to think, hmm, something else must be going on. Let's, let's now take a look. We do tend to do it up front. Well, or try, you can try some very simple therapies first. The other thing you can do is look at avoiding diarrhea. Most people who have Hunter's lesions or ulcers um, actually have small capacity bladders. So if you can get avoiding diarrhea where you record how much you drink and when, how much you urinate and when over a 48 to 72 hour period, if someone never gets more than a half a cup held in their bladder, then you know their bladder capacity is very small. 
So that patient you might want to take to the operating room and look for a Hunter's lesion uh, quicker than a patient whose symptoms may not be as severe or who, who uh, urinates a little more normally. <clears throat> Does having a smaller bladder capacity make prog prognosis worse for IC? I think so, because that's, those are the people that would be the only candidates for a major surgery, a urinary diversion. Uh, and they may be the people that respond most to neuromodulation or sacral neuromodulation, sacral nerve stimulation or inner stim. Um, in a study that we did, we actually showed that after inner stim, the um, bladder, the size of the bladder actually got bigger. So we're putting that together now. We had a question about Elmeron come in. Uh, can you get colitis associated with taking Elmeron? I, I, you know, Elmeron is, there's no question that Elmeron can be associated with, um, with dyspepsia, you know, gastritis, burning, feeling miserable, uh, diarrhea, et cetera. I've, I've never heard of a documented case of uh, colitis, meaning, and we're talking, colitis is defined as true colonic inflammation as assessed by biopsy, and I, I'm not aware of any specific instance where one can relate one to the other. Now, if you ask me, can you, is IC, some, IC itself sometimes associated with some of these inflammatory bowel conditions? Yeah, we, we have seen that. So it's hard to, uh, I, 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 unless Christine has something else. Uh, well, no, I don't think it. it causes colitis. Yeah. I think it may aggravate it um, yeah. in someone who has baseline inflammation in the gut. Uh, one thing that you can do is take it out of its capsule. Sometimes it's the components of the capsule that irritate the bowel. Uh, also, if pentosan polysulfate, uh, which is a glycosaminoglycan, uh, is irritating you. There are there is an over-the-counter product called Cystoprotec, which was studied in one small randomized control trial, and was shown to be effective over placebo. And we have started to use that in our practice, especially if the patient has an insurance that won't pay for the Elmeron because it's cheaper, and we really haven't seen the side effects that uh, Elmeron is noted for. Have either of you prescribed Elmeron, Elmeron via installation? I haven't, mainly because I, I, there's no specific, first of all, there's no data on it. That's number one. Uh, the, the, the standard that we, we, we were working with many, many years ago was to, to use heparin, heparin sodium in our solutions. And my, it's a matter of practicality. My hospital still has no problem getting into their pharmacy, so we just use it. I understand that in many practices out there, that's hard to get the heparin, so the, doc, the patients are already on the, the Elmron, so they'll just break up the capsule and pop it in. There's structurally, on a chemical uh, basis, they're very similar agents, so at least in theory, um, they can be interchanged. But again, that's theory. Okay. Can peridium be used daily? What are the problems associated with taking this medication for more than a few weeks? Well, if one was to look at the insert, the drug insert that comes with peridium, uh, it says that it shouldn't be used uh, on a chronic or a long-term basis. If it works for you, uh, you can certainly check kidney function by a test called creatinine because that's where most of it is metabolized. Uh, to keep an eye on it. But our goal is not to keep people on medications permanently. We're going to treat your bladder, your vulva, your muscles, and your bowel. And hopefully in six to 12 months, we're gonna make you well enough that you won't need to take peridium every day. Uh, you'll maybe have a mini flare instead of prolonged flares. We saw from the MAP data today that flares are different. They have their own subtype too. Some last minutes, some last weeks or months. So that uh, all, all goes with the subsets of patients. But peridium, you keep them ultimately should be used as needed. In the beginning, when a patient is really uncomfortable, it's probably okay off label to use it every day. Are there any particularly new medications that either of you are excited about for IC treatment? 
mind-body connection. I'm very interested in Dr. Kelly's presentation today. I'm very excited that the NIH has appropriated money to study acupuncture. I think that we can utilize a lot of these um, alternative or integral therapies uh, that can be used in combination with our standard therapies, and I think they're going to be very helpful. Let's face it. What is the biggest thing that flares your symptoms? Anxiety caused by stress. What do you do about that? Stress management. What does acupuncture do? It releases anxiety. And they, that, therefore, then releases the pain. So I would really like to get more people interested. The ICA did a survey of 11, uh, almost 2,000 people uh, recently, and it shows that a lot of IC patients do use complementary and alternative therapy. 55% of the patients were uh, recommended to do it by a physician. The problem was that it took people a long time to recommend it. Of interest, diet, rest, heat, physical therapy, yoga, prelief, which is calcium uh, glycerol phosphate, takes the acid out of food, um, were probably among the most helpful uh, among the patients. This was probably the biggest uh, survey that the ICA has done, and I'm so happy that it came out nicely. Um, and uh, is, are we published yet, Jen? No, we're still waiting, but it looks good. And would you agree with the self-help and alternative Oh, uh, yeah, I think that's, I mean, uh, that's sort of part and parcel of um, what I think should be standard care in an IC patient. I mean, we can't, the, the days where the patient was a bladder are gone. That's, you know, anybody who works in this field realizes this, and if they don't, then they're really not in touch with what's going on, and even the, at this point, the current literature. Um, as far as, you know, at, the, the thing is, we were all trained as bladder people. Yeah. <laughs> so it's still a lot of our therapies are, are, are directed there. And a case in point, uh, which I think is U.S. for interesting therapies, is uh, we're working with a company called Taras right now, who has this uh, little itsy bitsy device. It's called the Lyra system. And what it does is it looks like a tiny little pretzel. It goes, it's well, barely weightless, it's sort of like weightless, it's silicone. And it slowly releases lidocaine, just what we were talking about, these anesthetics in the bladder. Um, it slowly releases this over a two-week period. And we don't know what all the results are, but we're, in, we're, we're hoping to see that patients will start to improve. Preliminary studies look very promising. Uh, the other neat thing about all this basic research that's been going on for the past many years is that, you know, everybody's, you know, the big concern is what is IC? We can't, we, 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 what causes it? What's going on? And we still, of course, we, we, we don't know exactly how it starts or what mechanisms keep it going, but we've clearly defined specific pathologies that exist. And that's very important because it gives us targets. And, um, and, and I think that what we're, we're finding with the, the current epidemiology showing huge numbers of patients in the population where we thought this was once a, a rare condition, we're seeing a lot of interest by, by uh, pharmaceutical companies at this point to start directing attention. Because you know what? There's power in numbers. And now you have the numbers. So we're seeing specific therapies guided to specific pathologies that we know are present. Uh, we're right now, we're also investigating a new medication called the P2X3 uh, antagonist that will bind certain receptors which help transmit pain and, and, and may be involved with inflammatory processes. So there are lots of new things on the horizon. Unfortunately, they're not available yet, and we, we have a few more years till we get some real, hopefully, some home runs. But people are working on it. That's the important thing. Well, it sounds like there are medications on the horizon, and that does bring hope to IC patients. Mm -hmm. But we also have compounding pharmacies now. So while we're waiting to get these answers, and since there's at least 50% crossover of interstitial cystitis and uh, vulvar vestibulitis, uh, for which we use a lot of creams and things for, also, if you uh, examine a patient, and we use a little Q-tip, and we put it in little glands around the opening of the vagina. And if you get redness there and tenderness there, that's a provoked vestibulodynia. It's part of vulvodynia. However, 
if I do that and it's positive, and now I put medicine in the bladder, lidocaine in the bladder, and I re-examine the patient, and they're no longer tender, then the patient has a bladder-related problem and not necessarily just the glands. Or patients who present with urethral pain, you can put creams around the opening of the urethra that will soak in that can be very effective. Now, something about compounding pharmacies, and you guys close your ears back there. Um, one, we have a few that we use, but they re you really need to check them out. The people who work there need to be certified. Uh, they should have a sterile hood. And I would, in other words, when they're making the medications, it should be done in a sterile fashion so you don't get any contamination. They need to be good with the patients and not just charge them a whole lot of money and not give them good product. We test out all of our products on ourselves or on our most reliable patients first to make sure that they're suitable. And they're not always created the same, but there's a lot of medications that you can put in creams. A lot of our patients are hypersensitive. Uh, it was stated earlier uh, by Dr. Carr that you can't put some, it's hard to put somebody on the dose of amitriptyline that you would need to be therapeutic without them having a lot of side effects. Well, guess what? You can put it in a cream. And that way, the amount that's absorbed into the bloodstream is small, but you're getting the receptors in the area that, you, that have been identified as a pain generator. The Valium suppositories. Yes, the Valium gets into the bloodstream, but because it's in a suppository, it's like a slow release because it gets absorbed over a period of time. And so therefore, the patients don't have a lot of problems in terms of side effects. So there are a lot of creative things that we can do while we're waiting for our phenotypes or subtypes of uh, inflammatory, uh, non-inflammatory IC to be delineated. You know, that's Again, an interesting class thing. half full. No, no, I, I, I think that's a really good point. I, I think that uh, when you think about it, compounding pharmacies have a lot more latitude. You know, they can make up things for us. Uh, before you know the the, the form it formally gets to the big boys, mm -hmm. you know the the, the uh, whatever the the squibs and the this and the that and um, um, that is a neat thing and I think probably we're going to have more interactions with them. We certainly have lots and lots of interactions as you do and I can tell you some of those preparations have been uh, have had some remarkable successes. You know you talk about home runs. Yes. We've had some patients we put as Christine said I have one patient who had. Urethral, uh, urethral pain, just horrible burning, burning, burning in the urethra. And nothing was helping, and we couldn't put anything into the urethra. It was just a, a disaster. All the medications were failing, and we used this amitriptyline cream, believe it or not, just on the inner vagina, uh, on, right along the urethral course. And this stuff does absorb. I mean, it's, in a, it's it compounded in a way that it just doesn't stay on the surface. This is a girl who literally, I, she told me since she was a little girl, she had been doubled over every time she peed on the couch for about a half hour, 45 minutes. Can you imagine having a life like this? And now she's in her 40s, and um, she said this is, she's still burnt, okay? But she is, I mean, it's the first time I saw a smile on her face. It was just an, an incredible experience for me, and obviously for her. She says it still hurts her, but it's, she's not curled up on, on a couch. It's just, um, so these things do work, and they can be very effective in the right patients and with the right compounding pharmacies. Mm -hmm. Well, that's certainly great to hear. I believe we have some questions from the audience. Is anyone doing bladder transplants? The Mayo Clinic experimented with that back in the late 70s, early 80s in animals, and they just there was there was rejection um, at the site where the ureters go into the bladder. I mean, I, I think that's as far as it's gotten. Having said that, uh, there are people growing stem cells, they're growing bladders, not doing bladder transplants. The question with that is, if you take someone's cells and you treat them with all this fancy new stuff and then you put it back in the bladder and you grow a new bladder, um, since their type of interstitial cystitis might be just not a bladder problem, are they gonna grow back an IC bladder? That's the only problem with that. But yes, they are growing new bladders. Does IC put a person at an increased risk for bladder cancer? 
I don't think that there's any evidence that uh, interstitial cystitis is a, it's not that we haven't seen it. Um, particularly, we always worry. Every urologist who takes care of patients who have these inflammatory lesions of the bladder, called these Hunter's lesions, are concerned about this being something called carcinoma, carcinoma in situ, uh, which is a, a form of bladder cancer which can have uh, progress in a very nasty way. So we are always biopsying those patients and taking urine specimens to make sure that there are no cancer cells in them. But, and I can, I'm sure, and every practitioner, I'm sure you, as well as I, have both seen patients referred to, to us who didn't have interstitial cystitis. They actually had a, a bladder cancer. But in terms of uh, seeing an IC patient and ultimately uh, having, uh, Developing bladder cancer, no, not to my knowledge, it's not uh, higher than the average population. Now, one thing I will say is we have had, in this rare, I may have like one or two patients who have had Hunter's ulcers, Hunter's ulcer lesions, who've ultimately had bladder cancer. We found it after literally years. So I tend, at least in my practice, to be a little more cautious with those patients. And I will periodically send off what are called urine cytology, sort of like a pap smear of the urine to make sure that there are, there are no uh, cancer cells present. And if there's anything that clinically changes, that would warrant uh, another biopsy. Every patient with a Hunter's lesion gets biopsied to, to assure that there's no, no, no problems uh, beyond interstitial cystitis going on. Which ingredients in bladder installation treatments work best from your experience? and what is the average number of treatments for success? Well, I've been using pretty much the same one for a long time. It's affectionately known as the Whitmore cocktail, and it has, um, it has marcaine in it because it's a little more long-acting than lidocaine. We alkalinize it with sodium bicarbonate. Uh, we add, uh, add a little bit of uh, solucortef, which is a steroid, and uh, if the patient's uh, and heparin. And if the patient's doing it at home, because a lot of our patients live pretty far away, they do the bladder installations weekly times six themselves. Then we also add genomycin, just in case there's a, a little mistaken technique. Um, only studied once in an abstract, 64% uh, response rate. It was not a placebo compared to a placebo. However, alkalinized lidocaine has been. Uh, and it's been showed effective when compared against placebo. Um, uh, we use this very similar solution. Uh, we just, I, I mean, honestly, if you go on, I think it's on the website, the ICA website, yeah. uh, all the different uh, recipes that everybody has. Um, there's no sort of head-to-head -head comparison. They tend to be very empiric. It, it goes completely by empiricism. We're essentially throwing the kitchen sink into your bladders to cover all bases. So there's a little steroid in there to deal with any inflammation. There might be an antibiotic to deal with any infection we could give you or that might be existing. Uh, there's, um, there's medication to numb the bladder up, et, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, everything has, is geared towards some other pathology that uh, we're concerned about. Um, in terms of number of treatments, uh, it varies. I guess no one's really looked at it. Uh, one thing I can say, uh, and one of the reasons that the, these things are, these, these installations tend to do well, as I mentioned before, you would think that they would last only a few hours, but often they last for, for weeks or, or, or much longer, uh, a much longer duration than would it, one would ever expect just by knowing how they work pharmacologically, pharmacokinetically. So um, in terms of getting a durable response, a response that keeps on going and going, it's hard to say. Some people do well once a month and just use it for flares. Other patients literally need to do it three or more times per week. And that's why what Christine was saying is so important. When patients are, seem to be responding, the best thing to do is to try to get your practitioner to teach you how to do it yourself. And it may sound like, Ew, I don't want to do that, that's yucky and stuff like that. But it re once you know the technique, it's absolutely awesome. You, it's, you talk about empowerment, oh my God. I mean, you can direct what you need to do. You don't have to go to the damn doctor's office all the time. You don't have to be, you, could, you want to pop it in before you go to the movies, do it, you know, and sit, don't have to sit in the back end and on the aisle. Um, really opens the life up for many, many people, so. 
think we have time for just one more. Is IC limited to the bladder or can it migrate to the kidneys and ureters causing pain and damage? I don't think we have the appropriate answer to that question. However, having said that, um, I've had several patients who presented to me uh, with kidney pain or flank pain. Uh, no fevers, no chills, negative urine culture, and they have a tender bladder and frequency and urgency. And when their eyes see flares, they get kidney pain. And I don't think it's a disease, per se, progression to the kidney. I think that in certain patients, when the bladder goes into spasm, it transmits pressure to the kidney, which causes pain. Because that's what we see in the patients who've had their bladders taken out, who, the patients who wear bags. Uh, basically, they, the kidneys and ureters are tucked into a piece of bowel, which comes out to the skin, and then you wear a bag. And what happens in those patients, because a lot of them have irritable bowel, is that little piece of bowel squeezes and goes into spasms. Every time that happens, they get kidney pain. But unfortunately, in those patients also, they do have backup of urine into the kidneys and are more prone to get infections. But uh, you can get kidney pain. I don't know that it's part of the disease, um, but it can be there. The only, these are really rare situations. Um, we've seen some patients with something called eosinophilic cystitis, which is a, a, a variant of interstitial cystitis, another condition associated with an inflammation where it, it not only is a, a red patch, it's, it looks like a cancer. Uh, and in those instances, we've seen it ride right up the ureters and, and cause obstruction. But that's a, a real rare bird. Um, there was one other thing. Um, Ketamine, you want Ketamine, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, thank you. You're so, I know. Okay, this is actually, a very, it's, an, it's, it's a, a topic, unfortunately, that needs to be discussed further. There's a condition called ketamine cystitis. Thank you. For, that's the one thing. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a, we're seeing more and more of these patients coming in who've been on special K or ketamine. Uh, ketamine is used as a sort of a recreational drug. The reason it's used is because it, 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 they get their, the, the kids get their high, it goes away, they can drive away, and they're, they're cool for the night. The problem is many of these, these people are doing it um, several times a day, maybe three, four, five times a day, and it will, it will kill the, the, the bladder. Um, it, we've seen patients who are in their 30s that essentially look like a, a hunter's patient who's, been, who's, uh, who's had the disease for, for uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, the bladders are mangled. They often have uh, calcifications on them. Um, it's, a, it's a disaster, and those are, are, are patients who are coming in with a presumptive diagnosis of interstitial cystitis. They can't imagine it was a ketamine, but that's what, what, what the, uh, the problem is. And the big, our bi biggest challenge is, believe it or not, not that they're uh, dealing with their bladders. Our biggest problem is stopping them from using the ketamine uh, because they go back to their friends every time they go back to their friends, back to the same clubs after a while. Uh, so we're seeing this more and more in, in, in communities. Uh, it started more on the West Coast because it was closer to the avenue of the, uh, of the drug supply from, from Hong Kong. Uh, now it's coming to the East Coast as well. Well, um, that ends this session. Thank you, Dr. Whitmore and Dr. Maldwin, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.